once again, on behalf of me and my family, I want to wish all of you a very happy Easter. Now, when you and I tell someone happy Easter, and we're probably going to be doing that a lot today, uh, what do we mean by that, by that phrase? Well, it turns out that this English word, Easter, that we have is a highly modified German word. And Beatty and Claudia, you can correct me if I <laughs> mispronounce this because I don't know German like y'all do, but it's, uh, I, I believe it's Offerstehung. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Offerstehung. But uh, in German, that word means resurrection. And so every time you tell someone Happy Easter, it comes from that German word, and so you're actually saying Happy Resurrection. That's what you're saying. Uh, happy rising from the dead. Happy coming back to life. And, and if there's anything to be happy about in, in a world filled with sin and suffering and death, it's the hope of coming back to life. It's the Amen. hope of the resurrection. Amen. Um, and we have this hope all because our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, came back to life. Uh, please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to look at verses 1 through 10 today. Uh, all of the Gospels talk about Jesus coming back to life. We're going to be looking mostly at Matthew, and we'll look at some of the others as well. But Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10, and what it says about when Jesus came back to life after being dead for three days. Let's uh, look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. This is God's holy, authoritative, inspired, and inerrant, or without error, word. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. It reads, now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, See the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples Word, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is the word of our Lord through the Apostle Matthew. Amen. So our passage here begins in Matthew 28, 1, by establishing the specific time that Jesus Christ came back to life. We are told that it is after the Sabbath on the first day of the week at dawn. Now, before this, we are told, obviously, in other passages like Mark 15, 42 and John 19, that Jesus died on preparation day, that is, the day before 
the Sabbath. And, and it's very important for us to consider these things because notice that the text doesn't say something like Jesus died and came back to life once upon a time, like in a fairy tale. It's not the language that you see here. This is not once upon a time, a long time ago. This is real history, that, that Jesus died and he came back to life at specific points in real documented history. Uh, for example, as, as Christians, uh, uh, and, and historically we've been very confident about this since the Middle Ages, um, that, that Jesus died, if you want to look at a specific day, if you build a time machine and go back to that day, he died on Friday, April the 3rd, 33 AD. And he came back to life on Sunday, April 5th, 33 AD. If, again, if you wanted to use the way we look at time now, those are the specific dates that this happened. We're very, very confident about these. Um, but of course, we didn't call those April 3rd and April 5th. You know, back then, uh, even the days of the week back then had different names from what they have today. Uh, they didn't have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday like we do. Um, instead, our text says that Jesus came back to life on the first day of the week after the Sabbath. So what, what, what's the Sabbath? What is this particular day? Well, that word Sabbath comes from a, a Hebrew word meaning to cease or to stop or to rest. And that name goes all the way back to the very beginning of recorded history when Genesis chapter 2 verses 2 through 3 says, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done and he rested. That's the Hebrew word Sabbath. And on the seventh day, uh, he rested from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested, once again the Hebrew word for Sabbath, from all his work which he had created and made. And so from all of this we learn that the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week, which we now call Saturday. Uh, it didn't used to be called Saturday. It used to be called the Sabbath day. And later in the Old Testament, this day becomes a, a holy day, uh, the fourth commandment. Uh, many of us are, uh, have learned about these since we were kids, but the fourth commandment in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11 says, remember the Sabbath day the seventh day of the week, to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, nor you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And so because of all of that, the Sabbath, which we now call Saturday, became a very important part of Jewish life. It became a weekly day of worship because it commemorated the day in which God ceased or stopped or rested from his work of creating the entire universe. Uh, indeed, every other day of the week revolved around the Sabbath or Saturday. Now, the day that we call Friday, the sixth day of the week, that used to be called, not Friday, but Preparation Day. Preparation Day. Because it was the day before the Sabbath. And so if you weren't going to work, you kind of had to prepare, okay, if I'm not going to work the Sabbath day, then there's a lot of stuff i got to get done the day before uh, in order to make sure that everything's done that needs to be done. 
And so Friday was called preparation day in order to prepare themselves for the Sabbath day that was coming. Um, on the other hand, Sunday was simply known as the first day of the week. It didn't really have a fancy name because it just started the countdown to another Saturday Sabbath. That's so they just called it the first day of the week. So you're just starting the countdown over again. Uh, but now here, in Matthew chapter 28, something is about to happen that is even more significant than God creating the entire universe. You're like, what? More significant than that? Yes! Much more significant than that. What is this even more significant thing? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died on the cross for our sins, as the kids just beautifully sang about a moment ago, has come back to life. Yeah. He has come back to life. And, and, and this is so revolutionary. This is so game-changing that the first day of the week is going to get a proper name. Not, not just be called the first day of the week anymore. In fact, in Revelation 1.10, its name got changed to the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day. Uh, because this was the day Jesus came back to life. And, and so the Lord's Day, or Sunday, becomes so important for the church in the New Testament that the church begins worshiping on the first day of the week as opposed to the seventh because that's just how important the resurrection of Jesus Christ is. Because while remembering God as our creator is very important, there's a reason why we have a weekend with the seventh day and the first day, as important as remembering God as our creator is, it's not nearly as important as remembering our Lord as Savior. That's even more important. And so Matthew 28, 1 tells us that on these very real days in very real history, April 5th, 33 AD is what we call it now, Mary Magdalene and another woman also named Mary come to see the tomb of Jesus. And Luke 24.10 mentions there being other women with them as well. Uh, John 20, verse 1, also gives the additional detail that uh, all of these women initially got up and left to go to the tomb while it was still dark uh, and arrive at dawn. Now, the women's purpose for going to the tomb was not because they expected to find Jesus alive. That might be what we think. That they think, oh, yeah, they're, they're expecting Jesus to come back to life. No, that's not what they're thinking. Uh, that's not what they're thinking at all. Instead, Mark 16, 1 says that their purpose for these women coming to the tomb early Sunday morning is to finish preparing the body of Jesus for burial. That's why they're going. They're not expecting him to rise from the dead, they're expecting him to still be dead and that they would finish their preparations for his body. Now why, now, why did they have to do this? Why do they feel like they have to do this right now on this day? Well, it's because Jesus died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, which meant that there wasn't a lot of time before the Sabbath started on sunset that evening. And so, uh, what did they do in that roughly three hours of time that they had before sunset? Well, they, they took Christ's body down from the cross, got permission to do that. Uh, they uh, got a tomb uh, to place the body in. And then uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, according to John 19, 38 through 42, they start preparing the body with spices so it doesn't stink so bad. But they're not able to finish, run out of time, before sunset comes. And then when the Sabbath comes, again, you're supposed to rest. That's what the word Sabbath means. You're supposed to rest, cease, take a break. And so they have to stop. They're able to start finishing, preparing the body of Jesus for burial, but they're not able to finish. 
And furthermore, the Sabbath not only lasts from sunset on Friday, it goes all the way until sunset the next day, Saturday. And so there's not enough time to go and finish preparing the body of Jesus before darkness sets in. Of course, you didn't have electricity back in those days, and so they wait. They wait until Sunday morning. But while the women are on the way to the tomb, before they actually arrive, something happens. In Matthew 28, 2 through 4. Verse 2 says that first of all, there is a great earthquake. Not that earthquakes are great. That's not, that's not what it means. It means it was big. It was a big earthquake. Big earthquake. Not a little one. But there's a large stone that is in front of Jesus Christ's tomb that is moved. Uh, and, and, and many believe that this earthquake that happens uh, in uh, the, the, the dawning hours of April 5th, that earthquake signals the exact moment the body of Jesus Christ came back to life and then disappeared from the tomb. Because the angel who appears after the earthquake, the one who uh, rolls away the stone, why does he do that? He doesn't do it to let Jesus out. That's not the point. The point is not to let Jesus out. Jesus is already gone. And if Jesus can suddenly appear and disappear out of locked rooms, as we will see later in John 20, 19 through 31, uh, he doesn't need an angel to let him out of the tomb. Doesn't need an angel to roll the stone away. So why does the angel roll the stone away? To show that Jesus is no longer in the tomb. That's the point. It's not to let Jesus out. He, he, he comes back to life and disappears. Even, but he folds his grave clothes because he listened to his mama and uh, <laughs> folded his clothes like they're supposed to. Uh, but but uh, uh, he, he, he does that and he leaves. Just disappears. The stone is rolled away to show others he's not there. He's not there. He's risen. And so after the angel rolls the stone away and he sits on it, he's just chilling. That's kind of interesting. An angel just chilling. Um, his glorious appearance in verse 3 absolutely terrifies those who are guarding the tomb. They're scared to death. In fact, the, the English word seismic, we hear that all the time, especially when we're dealing with uh, earthquakes and stuff. That English word seismic comes from some, uh, the Greek word seismos, it's very, very similar. Um, and, and that word for seismic is used twice, both for the shaking of the earth in verse 2, which is what we would expect because earthquakes are seismic events, but it's used again, verse 4, for the shaking of the guards. That's how much they were shaking, like an earthquake. The point being is that when the natural is exposed to the supernatural, the natural shakes because it is completely overwhelmed by supernatural power. And, and if you don't believe that, just consider who these guards were. Um, th these were Roman soldiers. According to Matthew 28, 11 through 15, they were under the authority of Pontius Pilate, the governor. And uh, they were afraid of what would happen if Pilate ever found out. To fail at their guard duty meant the very real possibility of the death penalty. And yet fail they did. Not only because was the, the tomb open uh, all they could do was shake because they were too scared to, to do anything about it, and then they quickly ran away. Now, a typical Roman guard unit consisted of anywhere between four to 16 soldiers. 
Uh, and when not under duress, these soldiers would take turns being active while others would rest or take a break. But there would always be at least two to four soldiers who would, depending on the so size of the guard unit, still be active, keeping an eye on whatever is being guarded, even in the middle of the night. Uh, even sleeping soldiers in the guard unit would arrange themselves in either a circle or a semicircle, again, depending on whatever they're guarding, in order to be able to wake up and defend whatever they're guarding on a moment's notice. That's what they did. And so Roman soldiers were the best trained and the most disciplined and the most elite warriors on the planet at the time. They were like your Navy SEALs, you could say. And so if any force was going to do a good job guarding something, it would have been them. But after the earthquake happens, and the guards see an angel roll the stone away, and they thought they were going to die either way, they decide that they would rather take their chances with an angry authoritarian governor than with an angel. By the way, the next time you're afraid of somebody, and maybe you don't get afraid, but maybe you get intimidated by somebody, just remember, whoever it is, they're human. They're human. Um, nothing compared to an angel. And of course, angels are nothing compared to God. Still, angels are extremely intimidating. Uh, and having an appearance like lightning helps with that. Uh, but after the guards are gone, uh, the angel kind of scares them away. The, this angel temporarily disappears, uh, in, in, according to Luke 24, 1 through 4. And then the women uh, arrive at the tomb only to find the stone rolled away, which is not what they expected. In fact, they were worried, how are we going get to get rolled away with well, the soldiers? Let us roll away. They didn't know how this was going to work. So they enter the tomb. They find it empty. They're confused about all this. And suddenly the angel reappears, along with another one. And in Matthew 28, 5 through 7, we read, One of the angels said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. As he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I've told you. Now, there's a lot here. But um, as, as we've already seen, the, the, the supernatural shakes the natural. Uh, and, and so one of these angels has to tell the women not to be afraid. The Roman soldiers, they didn't care if they were afraid. They all could just take off. Uh, but, uh, but, the, but the women, he tells them not to be afraid. Uh, why? Why shouldn't they be afraid? Because they seek Jesus, who was crucified. Do you realize that when Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that wasn't an unexpected or unintended tragedy? No, it really wasn't. Instead, as Steve Lawson says, it was God's plan A. And when you're dealing with God's plan A, you know he's always going to accomplish it. There is no plan B with God. There is not. There's just plan A. And he always does it. And we know it's plan A because as Jesus himself said in John 10, 17 through 18, he says, I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Make no mistake. No one actually had the power to kill Jesus because he's the son of God. Instead, Jesus died willingly in order 
take your punishment and mine for our sins, for our pride, for our vain words, for our lies, our, our lust, our wanting things that aren't right for us to have. All of those things and more. He took that all away died on the cross so that you and I could be forgiven. Amen. And then Romans 6.23, we looked at this in Sunday school too, it's so true. He tells us that what we earn from sin is death. But Jesus never sinned, so he didn't have to die, but he chose to die in order to save us from death. And therefore, if Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died to save you, he must love you. Just like the kids saying, this is God's love letter for all of us. And if the most powerful being in the universe loves you, and you seek after him, you don't need to be afraid of anything. Nothing. You don't need to be afraid of death. You don't need to be afraid of other people. You don't even need to be afraid of an angel. That's one thing we see here in Matthew 28, 5 through 7. Another thing we see is that Jesus rose from the dead just like he said he would. Even if you just look at the Gospel of Matthew, we see that Jesus predicted his death and resurrection in Matthew 16, 21, in Matthew 17, 9, in Matthew 17, 23, Matthew 20, 19, Matthew 26, 32. That's just in Matthew. Many, many times he predicts, tells his disciples, I'm going to die and come back to life. So they shouldn't have been surprised when it happened. And yet they were for both things. They didn't think he was going to die. They didn't think he was going to come back to life. But now these women are being reminded of what Jesus said multiple times earlier. And now it's starting to click. Starting to click. And when Jesus predicted that he would come back to life in Matthew 26, 32, he told his followers that he would meet them again in Galilee, which is where Jesus spent the majority of his life in ministry, and meet them in Galilee, he would. Just as we see later in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. But because of their doubts and fears, Jesus also met them sooner in and around Jerusalem. Isn't that nice to know that even though um, we may struggle with some things, and we, we may not understand. We're not sure how it's all going to go down. And Jesus is patient with us. And, and, and he meets us uh, where we are. Uh, he definitely does that here. Because as we meet, read Matthew 28, 8, the women, they, they're still afraid, even though they're told not to. But thankfully now their fear is, is now also being mixed with great joy. They're, they're, they're happy about this. Um, Unfortunately, when they go back and they tell the disciples about what happened, the tomb being empty, the stone rolled away, an angel coming and talking to them. Um, when they go back and tell the disciples, Peter and John and all those guys, um, their story sounds like nonsense to them. They're like, you guys are crazy. You know, that's what they think. But Peter and John are at least curious enough to run ahead to the tomb and upon their arrival, they do find it empty, just like the women said. However, they don't see anyone. They don't see Jesus. They don't see the angels. They don't see anybody. So they head back. But John 20, 11 through 18 says that Mary Magdalene returns to the tomb alone. And while she's there the second time, she is the first, the very first, to see Jesus alive in the flesh. The other women then come and find Mary Magdalene and, and, and they hear from her that she actually saw Jesus alive and, and they're on their way to tell the disciples again, maybe they'll believe us this time, when Jesus meets all of the women. Here in Matthew 28, 9 through 10. And Jesus tells them instead of having fear mixed with joy, they just need to have joy. Just rejoice. Be glad. Why? Because if Jesus came back to life after dying, that means you can too. You can too. 
I, I heard Dr. David Jeremiah tell the story. Um, he says that, that every year people go, uh, thousands of people climb this mountain in the Italian Alps to find a very large crucifix. Uh, but one time there was a tourist, tourist who went up and they noticed the trail that was going a little bit farther past this fancy cross. And so this tourist fought through the thicket and to his surprise he came upon another monument, this one devoted to an empty tomb. But just like the trail going to the cross, um, the or unlike the trail going to the cross, the trail to the tomb was neglected and brush had grown up all around it. Uh, this tourist found that almost everyone had gone as far as the cross, but, the, but then they stopped. Far too few moved from the forgiveness of sins at the cross and went to the hope of the resurrection that's found at the empty tomb. One of my favorite passages in, in the whole Bible, and I, we looked at this in Sunday school, uh, John eleven twenty five. 25, uh, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he will live. And this isn't just talking about the immortality of the soul, although the Bible teaches that as well. Instead, this is talking about the literal resurrection of our own bodies after we die. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22 says, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And then still later in 1 Corinthians 15, 42-44, it says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and a spiritual body. Now, now some people hear all of this and they think, man, with the world though being as messed up as it is, why would you even want your body to come back to life? Wouldn't you be just happier as a soul in heaven? Well, not if Jesus comes back and fixes everything here on earth, which is what he says he's going to do. Listen to 2 Peter 3, 9 through 13. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all those things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Don't just trust in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You need to also trust in him because of the hope for the future that he gives us through the resurrection. Because when the new heaven and the new earth come, we as Christians will receive glorified bodies. As the book of Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. It's gone. All gone. And that, my friends, is why we say Happy Easter. 
or happy resurrection or happy coming back to life. Because not only did Jesus do that, that's what will also happen to you if you trust in him. Amen. Let's pray.